this is the thing we created this show. I mean, I love stories. I'm a psychotherapist. Maybe you know that. Maybe you don't. A lot, some of you know that about me. I have this long story career as a therapist. And therapy is really all about stories. And it is important that you know that about me, by the way, um, at the, at, right now, because this way, if we run long, you'll understand why we have to charge you for another show. <laughs> and I, I believe in therapy. Therapy changed my life, me personally. It really did. And, and you know, there's a point when you're in therapy for a long time where you say, like, how long is this supposed to go on? Like, how, how long is this really necessary? And I, when I was younger, I mean, I, I, I figured it out. I have an answer. You know you've had enough therapy when you become the person you used to make fun of in college. You just turn into the person that you don't smoke anymore, you don't have fun anymore, you eat all the right things, you hang out with all like healthy people, you don't, you don't make these big you know, tragic mistakes anymore that make all the good stories that you're going to tell when you're a lot older. Um, and when I got married, I had had a lot of therapy by the time I got married. And I believed sincerely that I wasn't going to have too much drama in my relationship because I know myself, I know what my triggers are, I know what his triggers are. I, we really are very, um, we, we're comfortable, we, we know the language of feelings, we know how to talk about things. And I, now I got married when I was 32, and I've been on my own since I was 18 years old. So I feel like I've been on my own a long time, I know myself, and so I go into marriage with this extreme confidence because of all my therapy and all my self-awareness. Now I will tell you that it was surprising to me that early on in my marriage, a little bit of tension started rising up on a regular basis around food. Now I lived on my own as a single independent woman you know, all about New York, and I cooked for myself, and I loved cooking for my husband. I loved having someone to cook for who loved my food. And we w I would find that we would get into this weird conversation every morning. He, while he's getting ready for work, I would, s and this, I, I mean, I, I find myself saying, what do you want for dinner? And he would say, I don't know what I want for dinner. It's eight o'clock in the morning. How do I know what I want for dinner? <laughs> and I say, well, how am I supposed to, give you what you want for dinner. I want to make something that you want. I want to make something that you like for dinner. That's why I'm asking you. And he'd say, whatever you make, I will love. And then I'd say, you're just saying that. <laughs> because you don't want to answer the question. And I want to know what you really want for dinner. Because come on, I want to get it right. And I have to plan my day too. And I would find myself getting really like defensive and angry if he wouldn't answer the question. He'd say, just make whatever you want. I have to go to work. But he was never edgy. That's how I, that's him in my head. The way I feeling defensive about him not answering the question. He never talks like that. He was basically running around finding his keys, his glasses, and his wallet and running to work late as always. Um, and uh, so then, so this became a thing. So then I cook because I love to cook for him. So I would cook because I wasn't sure it was what he wanted. I would make like a lot of stuff. I make a few different things. And then I would find that he would say, if he, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me. If he said, uh, if he said, this is a lot of food. And then I would instantly feel so defensive I would feel so almost angry that he pointed out how much how much food was on the table, and I would and I would find my, and I couldn't stop myself. I said, "Well, don't eat it then. If it's too much food for you, <laughs> if that's too much food, don't blame me. If you're gaining weight, that's not my fault. Just eat what you want." And I would feel so angry if he pointed out that it was a lot of food. But I just want to get it right. And I would find the next morning. Wait, what do you want for what do you want for dinner? I don't know what I want for dinner. It's eight o'clock in the morning. I know, but I just I have to plan my day too. I mean, really, don't don't you think you could just tell me what it, whatever you you make, I will love. So this is how we go. And I I find myself just I have to really bite my tongue not to ask this question even though it always ends in this weird t tension between us. So we go to visit my mom a few months after we get married. We go to visit my mom, and it's the first time my husband has ever been in my mother's house, because we met out here. She lives in Wisconsin. And I was very excited about, about showing my husband my home and all, my life where I grew up in Wisconsin. And we walk in the front door, 
And after a few minutes conversation, my mother says, what do you want for dinner? <laughs> and I say, I don't know, it's nine o'clock in the morning. And she says, well, I just want to make what you like. I just want to make what you want. And then I say, well, I don't know what I want. It's nine o'clock in the morning. I'm not thinking about dinner. And she says, well, how will I know that you like it if you don't tell me what it is you want? And I hear, and then I hear myself say, whatever you make, I will love. And uh, I saw, for the, in that moment, I saw a lot of things. I thought a lot of truths. One, I forgot until that moment, one, that for my mother, food equals love. So what she can make for you, if it's right, it's food. If she can make it right, she loves you. And if you eat it and you like it, you receive her love. And that's how it works. And I forgot about that. And I didn't know that that was even in me after all the therapy I had. And then I remember that my grandmother, my mother's mother, who was a widow twice, twice a widow, had a tenant that lived with her. Not even a husband, not a brother, nothing. And she would interrupt Sunday dinner to go to feed this man. She would say, I have to leave, I have to feed Albert. And she would go and feed this guy who lived in her house with her because feeding people is this family legacy of the women in my family. So I got back in therapy <laughs> for quite a long time, as it turned out. And maybe I'll, maybe I'll be in therapy until I figure out, um, no, I don't know. I am the person I used to make fun of in, in college. Uh, I am already that person, so I don't know when it ends. I don't know. I really don't know when it ends. So, uh, so you know, these are the things we think we know. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's my story for tonight. You know, our theme tonight is learning curves. And, uh, and marriage is one of those things that you learn. You learn, you most, you learn the most about yourself, to be honest. I mean, you really do. And you also learn how to interpret other people and how to understand other people. Just go visit your mother. You'll figure it all out. <laughs>